Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us. From Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Reverend Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Reverend Howard Caesar. So this is a test. Uh, actually, somebody sent me a test off the internet, and uh, I'm going to share it with you, have a little fun with you, okay? There's just uh, a few questions here, and do your best. Uh, you don't pass or fail, really. Um, so you're going to be okay. You'll be loved at the end of this. And uh, um, if you know the test, don't, don't give the answers, okay? So play fair. <laughs> um, so this is question number one. Uh, how, do you, how do you put a giraffe into a refrigerator? Some of you have heard this, huh? Maybe. The answer is open the refrigerator, put in the giraffe, and close the door. The question, it is said, tests whether you tend to do simple things in an overly complicated way. <laughs> Question number two, how do you put an elephant in a refrigerator? You open the refrigerator, you put in the elephant, and no, no, you don't do that. That's the wrong answer. That's what you thought, right? You open the refrigerator, put the elephant in, close the door, wrong answer. You open the refrigerator, you take the giraffe out. <laughs> and you put the elephant in and close the door. Okay. I can't even get it right from telling you the answers. <laughs> so the te this shows your ability to think through the repercussions of your previous actions. Okay. And this is a consulting firm that did this test. So, okay. Third question, uh, the lion, who is, you know, king of the forest and all that, is hosting an animal conference. And uh, all the animals attend except one. Which animal does not attend? The elephant. The elephant's in the refrigerator. You just put him there, remember? So this tests your memory. Okay, some of you are one out of three, actually. That's pretty good. Uh, some of you are 0 for 3, but anyway, here's your last chance. Question number four. Uh, there is a river you must cross, but it is used by crocodiles. Crocodiles are all full of it, and you don't have a boat. So how do you manage to cross this river? You jump in the river and you swim across. <laughs> Haven't you been listening? All the crocodiles are attending the animal meeting. <laughs> <laughs> And this tests whether you learn quickly from your mistakes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, according to Anderson Consulting Worldwide, around 90% of the professionals they tested got all of these questions wrong. But many preschoolers got several correct answers. <laughs> and so Anderson Consulting says this conclusively proves the theory that most professionals do not have the smarts of a four-year-old. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, um, <laughs> silly exercise, you say, but actually my point in all of this is to really get into the idea that all through life we have questions, and all through life we're looking for answers. They may not be how to put a giraffe or an elephant in the refrigerator, probably not, but the answers that we typically ask and should be continuing to ask, uh, some of them the same as we continue to broaden and expand into the answers, are questions like, who am I, and why am I here, and what is it that gives purpose and meaning to my life? We should really continue to be getting clear on some of those and other questions and answers like it. You know, in that quest, I think, to find the answers, you know, all of us take various routes uh, through our life, finding the answers. And, uh, you know, it begins in childhood, 
Uh, we each are born into a different situation, and uh, each situation contributes, contributes to the formation of our particular philosophy on life, our perspective on life, our, our consciousness as it is growing and changing. And uh, we may be born into, let's say, a very strict uh, religious family. And so it might have been uh, Christian, or one of the offshoots uh, could be Catholic, or one of the Protestants, uh, or one could be born into a, a, a Jewish family, or a Hindu family, or a Buddhist family, or a Muslim family, or um, you know w whatever. And, and any and all would then certainly have a part to play in the formation of one's philosophy. And uh, it, we most here probably have been exposed to one or more Christian paths, and. Um, it might have been a very strict uh, religious upbringing, or it might not have been strict at all. It might not have been uh, Christian at all, perhaps. You may not have even attended a church. I've met numbers of people that just did not have any kind of spiritual upbringing or religious upbringing as they were uh, growing up. So it may vary from a little to a lot around religious exposure. But basically, all of these kinds of things help to mold and shape a belief system, a philosophy on life. And, um, and kind of a, a perspective. And in addition to that, there are certainly other factors that come into play that mold and shape us and this philosophy on life that we're either conscious or unconscious of in various degrees. But there are things like our family of origin, there's our home life, there's our parents, there are our siblings, our relatives, uh, there are our schooling, uh, we already mentioned churches uh, or not, our teachers, our mentors, our, uh, the culture we grew up in, even the neighborhood that we grew up with, our friends that we, and kids and so forth. There's so many things. But some of our philosophy on life has also had a direct result um, with regard to our parents, our parents' belief system and our parents and how, what they modeled for us. Uh, they may have had a belief system, but we pick up that belief system in terms of how they're showing up, uh, things, conversation we overhear as a child growing up, all of these things. But at some point, we realize that really our, ch our, our parents r did not know everything, and they did not have it all right, and that we at some point began to think for ourselves and make choices. And, um, and yet, at the same time, we have residues of our past and our history that often unconsciously come up in the formation of the philosophy that we have or our, our perspective on life, our consciousness. So all of these factors, events, experiences that we have feed into the establishment of our own unique consciousness and our own philosophy, our experience of life. And contained in that is our sense of self-worth our sense of self-worth or our lack of it. And many of these things, you know, from growing up and the imprints and the different experiences and events all come to play a role in where we stand on that self-worth. Now, Jesus Christ is recognized, among many other things, but he is uh, recognized for having brought the emphasis and the importance to the law of love, the law of love. And he said that the greatest commandment of all was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. And he said, the second commandment, the second greatest, is like unto it, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Both of them stress to love, the importance of love. Get that. But I want to focus briefly on the second commandment, where he says, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself. And there are two aspects to that, clearly. And that one, one of them is to love your neighbor, and the other is to love yourself. And actually, if you pull out those three words, and simply lift them temporarily, um, your neighbor as, it says, thou shalt love yourself. And that's understood when you read that, love your neighbor as yourself. It's understood that you're not going to be able to love your neighbor until you really love yourself. That is uh, understood, very important. We forget how important in our spiritual unfoldment it is to be understanding of a sense of self-worth and an ability to love ourselves. Not in an egotistical way, it's to love yourself in a very spiritual sort of way. We'll talk more about that. But so much of the pain and the conflict that uh, occurs in our lives that we carry with us and that haunt us in various ways is from not having learned to love ourselves, truly. And we really can't love ourselves. We, we can't love our neighbor. We can't love our spouse, we can't love our children, we can't love anyone really the way it is love is fully intended to be expressed if we really do not love ourselves. Because you can't give what you don't have. 
you don't have something, it, it just doesn't carry the energy in giving it. And even receiving it is hard to take in if you don't have love for yourself. Uh, it'll come and it'll bounce off you and it'll reflect off in a way because you have not established your own sense of value, your own sense of self-worth, your own sense of I deserve love, I love myself, I love myself. It starts there. And so we can't give what we don't have. And actually synonymous is the words self-love and self-esteem. They're virtually the same. A healthy self-love is the most important ingredient in healthy self-esteem. If you're going to have self-esteem, which is talked about, you've got to have self-love. And true healthy self-esteem is rooted in knowing inwardly and knowing spiritually that you are of value. And that means you are of value no matter what. No matter how many mistakes you've made in your life, no matter what's working or not working, no matter what your past has been, you have value. And that, that is only something that you can grasp and understand at a spiritual level. Because we have all kinds of things that are happening and they're measurable and we can compare them to other people's lives and all these different things that can enter in and play a role to conclude that we're not lovable, we're not okay, we're not worthy, we don't have value. But you do, if you understand yourself spiritually. That's not easy, but it's a place to go. Things happen in our childhood where we make decisions and uh, you know, we interpret and conclude things about ourselves that are not accurate. And you've heard all of this stuff before, but essentially it goes on and we forget. It's like the woman who, you know, when she was five years old, um, her parents moved to another town in the same state. And uh, she was only four or five. And they gave her no explanation. It had to do with their occupation or their work. They put her with uh, their gran her grandparents, and so she lived with them. And they would see them, each other once in a while, weekends and so forth, but she felt left behind. Uh, she concluded that she was too, too much trouble to be with and things like that. And this really affected her self-worth. It affected her self-esteem. It later affected her relationships in life as an adult uh, until the point at which she began to own this mistaken belief that she had taken in about herself and began to unlearn it and unhook from it. So only you are responsible basically for your level of self-esteem. You can't put your level of self-esteem on anyone, anything. You can't put it on the past. Basically, it's, it's, it's not there. It's something we have to own and something we have to grow past or get healed of. And so we be, be, become imprinted with our past experiences in varying degrees. Um, on often many things and beliefs that we have are unconscious. You know, even biblically, there's uh, a great example for one who had low self-esteem was Moses. You know, remember Moses is out there and, and God comes to him and has a conversation and he, he says, you know, that he's calling, God is calling him to be the one to go to Pharaoh and to, you know, free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And so he's saying, God is saying to him, I want you to go to Pharaoh and free my people. And Moses essentially says, you got the wrong guy. You know, it's like, who, me? You know, but he, in, in all these buts, he said, but who am I? I mean, you read this in the scripture, but who am I? Uh, go to Pharaoh and do this, you know? Uh, he said, the people won't listen. He said, um, I'm not eloquent. He said, I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. All of these different things. Eventually, God won you know, reassured him, and he, and he went. But one could ask, you know, where did Moses get all these doubts and low self-esteem? Well, a psychologist would probably say, well, it was perhaps, you know, an imprint from his childhood. And one would say, don't you remember? He was put in a basket and let go by his mother and floated down the river, and he had, uh, you know, abandonment issues. And, uh, <laughs> you know, everything turned out, but, I mean, it's like we have an imprint on us. No matter how old we are, we pick up something that's gone on in the events and experiences of our lives. All of life is about relationships. All of life is about relationships. And we are in relationship with every aspect of life and creation. It's all around us. Every time we turn around, there's a relationship going on, whether we're conscious of it or not. And most important, of course, is our relationship with God. Our relationship with God. But an aspect of our relationship with God is with the God in us. All right? The God that is in us. The God in us is referred to as our higher self, our true self, or our Christ self. All right? And this relationship is very, very important in our unfoldment and in our progression. 
You know, whereas Western Christianity has put a lot of emphasis on the word salvation and that all everybody's working for salvation, we think of it as a little bit different. Yes, you save, you, it's salvation, but you save yourself from yourself, uh, your, your, your limiting beliefs and ideas and thoughts that are not the truth. So what you're working on is to save, be saved from yourself and from separation from God. But the way that, the word that we use and emphasize is awakening. Rather than uh, moving towards salvation, you're moving towards awakening and spiritual awakening, which is not an event like salvation is sought to be, but it's a process. It is a process that is being done over this lifetime, and wherever you leave off, you pick up because you're an eternal being. Whatever work you haven't done, you will continue to do. All right? Uh, so it's not a, a fine line somewhere that is arbitrarily and hard to determine that God has said, yeah, this is the cutoff point that goes to heaven and the others go to an unpleasant place. Uh, it's very hard to comprehend that, and most people really, even in Christianity, have begun to move towards some other concepts and beliefs around this idea. So this relationship with your Christ self is a very important part of your spiritual journey. Paul said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. So our journey is about letting this mind and heart be in us that was in Christ Jesus. That's what we're trying to open awake and, and awaken to. Low self-esteem and lack of loving ourself is basically a product of disconnecting from the part of us that is our true higher self, our Christ self. And that's why it's not of the ego. You see, sometimes people say, oh, loving yourself and all that is selfish. No, it's very distinct and separate because you are loving the part of you that is the God within you. All right? And it's not the part of you that in any way feels superior or inferior to anyone. It comes from the clarity of we're all equal, we're all one, we're all a beautiful creation in various places in our unfoldment and learning. And we're awake to that. Now, some of the characteristics of low self-esteem include things like just a strong need for validation from outside of yourself, um, a tendency to blame others, a tendency to blame yourself, a fear of change, the need to control and dominate others, uh, constant negativity or consistent, a need to always be right, um, always comparing, um, a, a kind of a black and white either or kind of thinking, excessive criticism, fault finding. These are a few of the things that are low self-esteem. Characteristics of high self-esteem would be getting your validation from within, not out there. Very healthy. It's, it, it, high self-esteem would be honoring individual differences, Listening to other points of view, not making others wrong. Uh, Self-respect, self-acceptance, self-confidence, being your own best friend, feeling love toward yourself in the healthiest of ways. And society tends to emphasize that our worthiness really comes from what it is that we do. You know, it's our accomplishments, it's our education, our income, our materiality, it's how we look, all of these different things. So much has to do with what we have done. Um, our, our accomplishments are not bad, understand that. But it's, it's just that the belief that we get to be loved for what we do is very unhealthy. And you can never, you know, it's nev you'll never do enough. And so you have to get back to a healthier belief that says, I get to be loved for just being. God created me. I'm a being of love. I get to be loved just for being, because I exist. Okay? Now, everyone else doesn't have to love me but I'm going to love myself. I'm going to be my friend on this journey. And even in the midst of our mistakes, we have to be able to um, keep loving ourselves. It's vital. Where self-love is lacking, we basically have a tendency to risk. We have a tendency to take a chance. We don't want to change things up. We want to play it safe. We don't branch out beyond the status quo. The spiritual journey requires that a person have high enough self-esteem that they begin to follow their higher self. And their higher self wants to be birthed. They want to be awakened to it. And you're going to have to be willing to get comfortable with change. Change isn't easy till you begin to love yourself and make it OK. Because it takes courage in the journey uh, to go outside of the boundaries that are prescribed oftentimes by friends, by family members, whomever has a voice into your world. It requires self-confidence and self-love and self-esteem. And there can be pressure for, put on us from family members and old friends who don't want us to change or to move out of their circle of thinking. And it can bring up sometimes their hidden insecurities. And they may pull away from you. They may argue with you. They may lecture you, label you, and even make you feel wrong or guilty 
because you believe something different or are going a different route to some extent. It takes courage to explore new places and new ideas. And an awakening person knows that all interactions with people and events have meaning and purpose. You know, they know that one's beliefs become the rules, really, or the laws that govern one's life. And a person's life takes its unique twists and turns. All of ours are different. But it exposes us to things that we may not be ready for, so we don't make anyone wrong because they're not accepting our beliefs or our ideas or our thoughts because not everyone is ready. That's okay. They are where they are. We love them because we love ourselves. And so there is times when we have to recognize when we don't have any space for listening and learning about something. And we have to look at that and notice that and become conscious of it. One of my friends tells about a time when she was in her early 30s, or 20s, actually early 20s, and she was, asked, she had, was a person who asked questions, questions, had a curiosity, curiosity of very much an openness. And anyway, she, tell, she tells about a time when she met a couple. It was a young couple, and they had had a, a baby, and it was six months old, and the, she got to know this couple. And the baby had um, a number of birth defects, and it was therefore not going to live terribly long. And so she talked with these parents, got to know them, and, and they presented to her ideas that she had never considered before. And so they had been studying books on Edgar Cayce, and uh, they had uh, contacted the foundation, Edgar Cayce Foundation, and had a, a soul reading on their child. And they had gotten into the belief of reincarnation, and what they had come to understand is that they had things to learn and experience with this child that had disabilities, and that, that it had come to, to them for them to learn and for this being, this soul, to learn. And they really were able to put it into a healthy perspective and it really helped them. And it opened her up, you see. And she saw that as, a, as really part of her soul path. Because from that place on, she opened up uh, to uh, a willingness to understand more things. In fact, the, even the you know, idea of reincarnation was born in her as a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ. And it's a fact, of course, that reincarnation was a part of Christianity up until somewhere around the middle of the fourth century when it was removed by the church in kind of a polit political meeting that was at the Council of Nicaea. But anyway, moving on, there are things that happen in people's lives, things like near-death experiences of which we have eight or nine or ten or we've lost count, million uh, individuals recorded. And this gives us a different look at this something that in the West has painted one way of death being in a religious terms and, and a, a whole nother kind of view of the afterlife and, and things. And do we ignore it or do we integrate it? Um, and, and it's like that. Are we to be afraid of it, or are we willing to, to think about it, talk about it, not be afraid? Our beliefs are very significant to what experiences we have on our spiritual path, and our, our beliefs are tied to how open we are and whatever larger fields we will then become exposed to. If we're shut down and afraid, we're not going to really open up to what is there to learn and to experience. And so it all has to do with a degree of positioning within the framework of your own consciousness. A few weeks back, I told you a story about a person uh, who's an author. He's authored a new book. It's called Messengers. And he spoke at a luncheon that I attended in Overland Park. And uh, in the novel, it ta it's, it's really a novel about deeper realms and uh, has some elements of, of truth of the, of the mystical aspects and what have you. But anyway, uh, in his talk at this luncheon, he gave two personal experiences, uh, real experiences to him. And I shared one a few weeks back, and I share with you another, which opened him up to writing this kind of a book. It just, and, and he had that kind of openness to begin with. But what, he, what he's told about was he was driving along um, on the Audubon with his wife. And you know, on the Audubon, I've never been on it, but you can go fast. <laughs> All right, so that's a stretch. And anyway, he was in a Mercedes that they had rented, he and his wife, and they were going, he said, about 120 miles an hour. And they were going on down, and they were cooking along and doing just fine, and all of a sudden his car went dead. Stop. Uh, pushed on the accelerator, nothing there. This is a new Mercedes, no problems. Ran like, like wonderful. Anyway, he put it in neutral and was able to coast off an exit and had just enough momentum to get into a parking lot of a restaurant just uh, sat there for a little bit, and, and he said to his wife, I think there's something to this, that there is something, you know, uh, intuitively. And he happened to look at his watch, and his watch had stopped. And it had stopped at about the same minute 
or second that the car went dead. He asked his wife. She looked at her watch. It had stopped. Then they went in the back seat and got the digital camera. It was stopped. They got the video camera. It was stopped. And so um, a few minutes later, he tried the ignition, and it worked. It started right up. Uh, so they got back on the Audubon and uh, went down about a mile, mile and a half, and there had been a multi-car accident. And um, there were a lot of people that were seriously hurt. They got out and they helped and so forth. Um, but it was clear that something had intervened um, from them going at 120 into this, which would have been um, unfortunate. And they were very, very grateful for it. Now, I contend that this experience was there be partly because he was open to it as well. But there's something in Romans that states in Scripture, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us. All right? We all open up to grace at different levels because we're at different places. It's not that grace isn't there for us all. Not all of us are really open to it. And so all of us can ask, you know, what is out there that I have yet to experience? What is it that I have shut down, worrying about what people will think or who knows what? Uh, I don't know. You have to look within yourself. I'm not talking about going crazy with thoughts and ideas and beliefs, but being willing to, to be bold enough and loving of enough to embrace your higher self, your Christ self, that has things for you to learn through experience. And you have to have an openness to it. Our curiosity and willingness to grow and learn is what will keep you open to the new experiences, the new people, the new places, the things that are there to explore. We're in a time when a lot of things are shifting and changing, even energetically, and it calls for people to have a greater degree of openness. An awakening person is, is on a journey, remember, of loving themselves and loving life and knowing that all interactions with life, with others, with their neighbors, events, they all have meaning. They all do. That no matter what, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your past, you deserve love. I believe in what is called God's esteem stream. There is a stream that we step into if we know it, where we're able to love ourselves no matter what. Every morning, wake up with the thought that you love yourself because God does. Step into the esteem stream. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's Thank you, message. Wonder we invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org. Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us.